comedy on Thames. Mr. Bean rides again in a series of hilarious sketches. And a brand new series starring Harry Enfield and Martin Clunes. They're men behaving badly. Je m'appelle Dermot, I'm sensitive and artistic. <laughs> Plus more marital harmony with Donald and Patsy. How are sexual relations between you and your partner? Can't remember. Well, that's love. Beginning next Tuesday at 9.30. Without Wars on Channel 4 in a moment continues its series Fan de Siècle. Here on Thames, we follow the work of the Murder Squad. He's back for a dramatic new series of investigations. I'm now looking for the murder. Van der Valt returns to Thames tomorrow at 8 o'clock. He will experiment with all the beers. Cigarettes can seriously damage your health. If you don't put them out properly, both you and your house could well go up in smoke. Don't let a fire be your fault. This Thursday, it's Taggart. I'm trying to trace the movements of your needle, Mr. Long. Perhaps you could come in, then we could... Perhaps you could... What I like about this job, public cooperation. Now, a new series, Murder Squad. The following programme, which is a factual documentary, follows the Metropolitan Police during murder investigations. The programme includes some scenes and language that viewers may find disturbing. The mixture of people from every corner of the world makes Stoke Newington one of the most colourful parts of London. But the crime rate is a major concern. Street robberies, drugs dealing and prostitution are common and the murder rate is amongst the highest in the country. On the 23rd of January, 1990, as a result of a telephone call from a woman, police went to a flat in Shackerwell Road. It was a council flat that had seen better days. However, the police video unit was not interested in the condition of the flat. They were more concerned with the body of an elderly man in the middle of the wreckage in the city. He had been covered in white paint and battered to death. The dead man was 69-year-old Douglas Piper. The woman who telephoned the police said that her mother and her mother's boyfriend had murdered him. <laughs> The day after the murder was reported, the area major investigation pool was called in. The first members of the murder squad to arrive at the scene were the forensic experts. Shortly afterwards, Detective Superintendent Russ yeah. Allen arrived to take charge of the investigation. I'm obliged. I want to see what you mean. I thought possibly the person that's killed him yeah. has then gone on to wipe his name off the wall or something like that. Yeah. Um, but when you look at the, the pot, yeah. Um, obviously they've not cleared the room away to do what they have done, yeah. but there are things there running along, there's a hammer or something down there, isn't there? Yeah, paint splashes on the coat, um, piano, right? Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, there is paint splashes on various bits and pieces. But that's a lady's yeah. footprint, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's sharp pointed ones and rounded, which are which I don't know at the moment. And that's a male? It could well be. But there again, 
were they done when that was painted, or were they done when they did that? The incident room was set up in a porter cabin in the car park of Stoke Newington Police Station. Detectives were taken off other cases to form the murder squad. Basically, a phone call went in at 10 to 9 last night um, to West Ham Police Station. They were briefed by a local detective. He told them what had been discovered since police received the phone call from Sandra Coletta, claiming that her mother, Pamela, and her mother's boyfriend, Steve, had murdered Douglas Piper. The inquiries that we've made to date appear that Piper, in fact, the deceased, was the boyfriend of Pamela Coletta, or Pamela Coletta was his girlfriend. Yeah. He, over a period of time, has had in lodgers for two or three days or a week and what have you. A few weeks ago, this other lad, Steve, um, moved in and was lodging for a while. And what it appears is, basically, he has stolen the affections of Pamela. On the night before last, again from our inquiries, it appears that Steve went out for a short time. Yeah. And when he came back, Douglas was uh, obviously trying to re-win the affections of Pamela. And it appears that uh, he caught them in the act. Murder squad detectives then visited Sandra Coletta. As I understand it, you know, your, uh, your mum, pa your mum's Pamela, isn't it? Pamela, that's yeah. correct. She came here yesterday. Yeah, she about half past eleven yeah. with her boyfriend Steve. But they didn't bother to say hello or anything. They just come through the door and said he's dead. And they said he's dead. I said, What are you on about? And they said we like killed him. So I said, Oh, like this old bloke they've been staying with Doug. Who was who was saying that? My mum was saying that. Your mum was saying that. Yes. Apparently they'd all been out for a drink, yeah. got home about quarter past one. This Doug sent Steve out, who's my mum's boyfriend. Yeah. And um, like he said he got back and this Doug was lying on top of my mum trying to rape her. So he's punched and kicked her. Then they left him lying in the grate. They went to bed about quarter to two in the morning. My mum said that when she got up in the morning at seven o'clock, he was just lying there cold. And her boyfriend, he's put the fire on, like thinking he can warm up the cold body. But I mean, obviously, by that time he was dead. Where has your mum gone now? I do not know. Did she say? No, she you know, just said, we're going here or we're going there. Come on, Steve, she said, we're going. This was about quarter to seven last night. Uh, What's Steve's other name, do you know? I do not know. All I know about him is that he comes from Bedford somewhere. For whatever reason, he's happier, I don't know. But he said when he was, lived in Bedford, he was always getting in trouble with the police. Do you know what sort of offence is that for? bodily harm, robbery. <coughs> yeah. And tomorrow, which is Thursday, he has to sign on at the Dole office. Do you, know which, do you know which one? Please? Yes, it's in Shoreditch. He gets, like, personal issue, like, money over the counter. So he's got to go there? Uh, yeah, and I've told the police, like, that came round last night. As I understand it, they may have had some paint on them. Is yes. there some suggestion of that? Yes. They um, had white gloss paint on their shoes when they come here. Did they leave anything here? Well, they went out for an hour in the afternoon and they left their carrier bags here. And I was a bit suspicious, so I started looking through them and they'd taken the old man's pension book. You saw it? Yeah, I see two income support books and a retirement pension but I put them all back in the bag and I, but as I said I didn't have a really good look because the bag smelt of paraffin or petrol some substance like that but I mean obviously I didn't say anything to me mum and like I've told did they clean themselves up here um only their shoes they seemed really callous I mean they just didn't seem to care less you know I mean the way that they come in here and said like he's dead he's dead and I mean, I think it shocked me more than anything else to think that, like, they could have murdered But do you some. believe them? I don't know what to believe. I mean, all I can do is tell you what I know. Oh, yeah. You can't imagine how I feel. I mean, to think, oh, you know, it's bad enough when you hear of it on the news, like someone getting murdered and that. Someone to come around here, especially like when it's your own mother, like say they've murdered someone. I mean, I was stupefied. Unreal, like, isn't it? It is unreal. I mean, she's a nutter anyway, and he looks like one of these psychopath people. Is your mum violent then? 
Um, no, but she's an old snake. Oh. Oh. I see. Sorry, well, I mean, how else yeah. can I put it? Yeah. I mean, she would go with anyone as long as they've got a few bob. At this stage, there seemed little doubt that Pamela Coletta and her boyfriend Steve were the prime suspects. The murder squad's job was to find them. They, they went missing at 7 o'clock last night. They've already got, what, 16, 18 hours start on me. I don't even know the identity of the man. And to find someone called Steve is, is a proverbial needle in the haystack. So until such time as we identify who he is, can we make you know, inroads into getting him? Plus the fact, what we have been told is we think he signs on at, uh, for his social security tomorrow morning. If he's desperate for money and he wants to get away, and you do need money to get away, he will have to sign on tomorrow morning to get his money. Therefore, we'll know where he is. So there's not, you know, we don't have to break our neck over it at this stage anyway. I could be wrong. The post-mortem was conducted at Hackney Mortuary by Dr. Peter Vanessis observed by a pathology student from Singapore. With uh, hemorrhage right on right temple. extending to the right eye. Towards? No, two, not towards. Two. Sorry. Two. To right eye. Right eye. Associated hemorrhage in eye. Bruising extending from lower lip. Members of the murder squad have to attend the post-mortem, often with mixed feelings. The actual event is... Uh, it's interesting, but the thing that puts me off most of all is the smell. I can't stand it. But it's one of the things you've got to suffer, isn't it? Um, I come outside and have a quick cigar. I'm not, I'm not a smoker, but uh, it's the only way I can cope with, uh, with the smell, these sort of things. This is a particularly smelly one because it's starting to um, disintegrate. I just take it as part of the, of the daily, daily work. Fraud yesterday. Could you see this level of bruising being come from fisticuffs as opposed to the kicking? No, it's got to be a kick. Fisticuff, yeah. I mean, too wide for, for yeah. a fist. All in all, he's had a, a right hammering. Yeah, he's had the one there with the with the thyroid cartilage on the... It may well be, in fact, the same same one because it's quite high up could there. A, could be a whole foot going could across the Could be the whole, whole foot going across the face, yeah. There's no way the entire place would have... Oh, sorry, I didn't make your thoughts. I'm sorry. The, this is the right side. That's a separate injury. Right. That one. The, the thyroid cartilage damage is on the left side there, right? And you've also got the bruising to that side of the chest and neck. Yeah. On that side. So you've got one injury there caused by probably a kick, more likely to be a kick rather. That one is also a further injury. It's totally separate. Caused by, again, a, either a severe kick or a stamp. Mm -hmm. um, Could he have got either of those from falling? No, that's, went down? That, no that's impossible. That's impossible. That one's too widely, widely spread for a start. And they've got to be uh, deliberate blows. Right. OK, well, I'll probably right. come back in a few days just to have a, okay. another look to see if anything's come out. Thank you, Neil, very much. OK. Can we offer to buy your pint? Uh, I'd like to, but my wife's expecting me for dinner, I'm afraid. Oh, oh. I'm already a bit late, it's very kind of you. Well, thanks very much for staying on. Pleasure. With confirmation from the post-mortem that Douglas Piper had died from injuries caused by a violent attack, the hunt for the two suspects was intensified. What we must be doing tonight is uh, circularising BTP, British Transport Police, ask them if they can do a sweep of the stations and see if these two are sleeping rough around there. I would like the Amherst pub done this evening if someone fancies going for a pint and confirm they were in there on the Monday night together. They left at 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock last night? 7 o'clock, sir. So they've got 24 and a half hours start on us. And uh, so what we're going to do is try and make up that time. We may get the bin stopped. We know the woman's name. We may get the man's name through British Transport Police who have been stopped at yes. the stations in the past. Yes. But I think, I think my, my own um, assumption would be they'd go for a crowd, and where's better than a station, and where do I, where else do people doss but stations? And I would favour that. 
we had from Sandra, the, the daughter of Pamela, a suggestion that Steve came from Kempston near Luton. We telephoned there earlier and they searched through the LIO's records and came up with two possibles. To establish the surname of the man called Steve, Detective Superintendent Allen compared the descriptions of possible suspects supplied by Bedfordshire Police with a description of Steve from Sandra Coletta. Right, he's about six foot, six foot one inches tall. He's white, 23... Stop. Six, height six foot two, and he's white, yes. Right, so he's about 23 years old. Stop, born 1965, so we're not yeah. far out there. Um, he's got a swarthy complexion. Swarthy um, compl complexion, hang on. A possible gypsy, gypsy type. No complexion Action. here. Uh, he's got short black greasy hair. Uh, certainly got uh, short hair uh -huh. here. This says brown, but it's uh, certainly short. Um, which he wears, um, whenever she's seen him anyway, comb back and parted in the middle. Um, Can't tell from this picture. He's very slim. She spoke of a tattoo, having a tattoo, one she's seen on his left forearm, but she cannot remember what it is or describe it to us. So she is thinking about it and she's... We've got uh, tattoos on his right forearm, and we've got Steve on his left forearm. And he's got Elvis and a love heart on his right shoulder. Well, I don't suppose she was inspecting no. that, do you? She's obviously going to mull it over, and yeah. uh, I'd like to speak to her again. Well, anything possibly helps at all. We've... I've got two... As the two photographs from Bedfordshire Police would not be required in evidence, like Detective Constable Pleisner was able to show them to Sandra Coletta. If you, if you believe either one of them is Steve, I wonder if you could let us know. Mm. I'm talking about, you know, the person who came here. I don't here. think so. The I one is with your mum. Angus, come and look at these. I don't think they're alike. Because you've seen them as well, haven't you? No, I'd say not. No? No. No, definitely not. It was just obviously suggested that I show you these to you because, as far as we're aware, these two men both come from the Bedford area. No, definitely not. Definitely not. No, even Angus says that, no. Oh, that's right. Ah. Well, here are we. Well, apart from me, that is. And the team that's gone north. After three hours' sleep, the squad reassembled. Right. Overnight, there had been an important development in their effort to identify the male suspect, Steve. As you know, we've got two uh, possible suspects sent down from Bedford. And then uh, later on, the guy up there is working like an absolute, thanks very much, an absolute beaver. And he came up with the third suspect, uh, Stephen James Chandler. Good old Tony here went back for his third trip to see Sandra, got her out of bed. And... Um, she says, yes, yeah, she's totally positive that uh, the third photograph that we showed was, in fact, the, uh, the suspect. So, what we did then was to launch Colin Johnson up to Bedford this morning, and I arranged with the, the ACC and the local police station to have some troops available this morning, in particular one who knows the suspect. Bearing in mind that, from what Sandra says, they were up there before Christmas, they may have run up there again, especially if they didn't have any money. Stephen John Chandler, um, as you've got there, is born on the 5th of December, 66. The description basically is beside you. He's got tattoos on both arms. On the left arm, there's a cross, the word anarchy, and the initials NF. And on the other arm, the right arm, there's something like two A's and the word Sid. For Pamela Coletta, she's obviously white, five feet five inches tall, has black hair, which we're told um, most recently was combed back with hair slides on both sides. She's about 50. Now in the photograph, her hair's down, but as I said, it's set back more now. Stephen Chandler is quite well known, as you can see, has got um, a history of uh, criminality, and uh, ha including assault. Obviously, there's been a severe attack on this elderly man, and uh, there's the possibilities he may be violent. We'll just take it as it comes. I think he has visions of uh, 
being a bit bigger than what he actually is. He doesn't seem to um, take things too normal. I've never known him to work, so uh, whether he thinks uh, he can live off his life of crime or not. What sort of record has he got? Um, minor. Uh, ABHs. Um, he has some minor offences um, in the past. Um, indecency as well. He can be violent? He could be, yes. It was thought that the suspects may be at the home of Chandler's mother and stepfather. Detective Sergeant Johnson and the Bedfordshire officers surrounded the house. Hello, Mr. Stafford. It's not. Ah, I'm Peter Keating, the local police of the area. This is Detective Sergeant uh, Johnson. Johnson from the Met Police. Yeah. Is it possible to, to come in and just have a word? When police searched the house, Stephen Chandler was not there. We're looking for two people in relation to that inquiry, and one of them is Stephen. Detective Sergeant Johnson then spoke to Chandler's stepfather. Have you seen him at all recently? Not since Christmas. Have you had any contact personally with him since Christmas? No, not that I can think of. No, I don't think he's even phoned since Christmas. He hasn't. He popped back for two days. Christmas. I can't remember. Oh, no. Do you know where he's staying at the moment? I don't. Maureen yeah. will. Maureen adopted Stephen Chandler as a baby. So the last time you spoke to him was actually in person, was it? Oh, yeah. As opposed yeah. to on the telephone? Yes, we, we took him and this woman, what was her name, Pam or Pam, that's it. Mm. And we gave them a lift back to the station. What, to Bedford Station? Yeah. Yeah. And they, what, caught the train? Yes, well, I presume we left yeah. them at the station, yeah. And is that the only time you've seen Pam? Yeah, the one and only. Yeah. <laughs> Had you heard about it before or not? Not a word. I walked in from work one day and there was Stephen and Pam. Mm. And that was the very first time I'd set eyes on them. Yeah. Had he spoken about her at all or not? Um, no, not really. I had heard... He said something about, or he said something to somebody else about he was he was going with this older woman or something mm. in her fifties, I think she said. And I mean, we sort of laughed and left it at yeah. that, you know. And did it did it fit the description? Oh yes, it fitted like. the description. Yeah. Yes, I must admit it was rather a hilarious couple of days. When, was it? So yeah, they, both, they stayed. They stayed, they stayed just um, yeah the two days, and then mm. I must admit I made sure that they left. Yeah. Oh. You got the right person. Good. And, and she, she confirmed. Joe, oh, she's met Pamela then. Good. Right. Okay. Well, so you've had a wasted journey. With the confirmation from Bedford that Stephen Chandler and Pamela Coletta were the suspects, the murder squad could now concentrate on finding them. Sandra Coletta had told the squad that Chandler was due to collect his unemployment benefit from the Shoreditch Unemployment Office that morning. This was where Detective Superintendent Allen set his trap. I'm freezing. Yeah. Murder squad detectives in three unmarked cars began what could be a long wait outside the unemployment office. One unit was in an alley at the side of the building. Oh, no. See what's coming up there on the left? No. No. If he's got a PO, he might know we've got an operation here. You know how that is. See that program on the Brick Lane, Brick Lane Nick? Yeah. That's the PC at the end of it. Harry, Harry somebody. Remember? Remember he's minted down the road at the end? That's him. As time passed, the murder squad waited. There was no sign of Stephen Chandler or Pamela Coletta. <laughs> Cap.
Rapid pollen filter for the new Astra is jolly exciting, Atkins. Yes. They say it helps stop pollen, fumes, and all manner of dust particles from getting up your nose. Indubitably, Titi. What's our motto, Atkins? You never sell anything you haven't had. Yes, it doesn't sell, Titi. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> Cafe, that delectable taste and unmistakable aroma. I'm just popping out. Oh, Michael, on your way, would you remind Mrs. Bly that I've invited her for a cup of Nest Cafe at 11? Of course, Ange. You will be polite, won't you? Nest Cafe, coffee at its best. Well, did you pass on my message? Of course, she gave it a thumbs up. What? Well, actions speak louder than words. When you see a child in pain, your heart goes out to them. The Variety Club of Great Britain has been working for 40 years to help sick, disabled and disadvantaged children. Now you can help us help them. This year, February the 14th, isn't just Valentine's Day, it's Gold Heart Day. For just one pound, you can have a heart and help us raise five million pounds for our children. So go on, wear your heart on your sleeve, show you care. Kellogg's Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes. Delicious golden flakes of corn encrusted with honey, nuts, and brown sugar. Which makes the more to the most irresistible breakfast imaginable. Kellogg's Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes. The trouble is, they taste too good. Ever dreamed of winning enough cash to buy a pool, a car, even a pool in a car? Then join the Millionaires Club, because every day with the Millionaires Club in the Daily and Sunday Express, there's a chance to win a cool million pounds in cash. With Millionaires Club, readers have already become millionaires. And now, it's your chance. Join the Express Millionaires Club, and you could win one million pounds cash. See tomorrow's Daily Express for details. Sorry, love. No milk. You need a coffee. Oh, lovely. Coffee, mate. Oh, well, haven't you got any milk? Not sure I'm going to like this. It's always a first time. Nice. Very nice. Could get used to this. I bet you could. Believe it or not, plenty of people prefer coffee, mate. However you discover it, you'll be glad you did. This man doesn't know that smoke and fumes kill you in your sleep. He never will. Wake up. Get a smoke alarm. He's back. On the boat. For a dramatic new series of investigations. I'm now looking for a murderer. Van der Valt returns to Thames tomorrow at 8 o'clock. too far anywhere on her own because she's going to panic, isn't she? Okay. Throughout the morning, murder squad detectives waited in unmarked cars for Stephen Chandler and Pamela Coletta. At 11.45, the suspects appeared. Pamela Coletta, yes. they're also under arrest for suspicion of the murder of uh, oh, Dougie Piper. Not like saying this, we should do so. Let me say, but down right, don't be nervous. Do you understand? Yes. Right. Let's get some wheels down here. Go on the main set. Ooh. That's them wheels. Come over here, love. Yeah, but I didn't hurt you much. Pardon? I just did that a couple of times. You're under caution, love. You must remind you, you are under caution. We'll be taking down maybe the evidence. Do you understand that? Right. Can you just stand there, love? I don't mean to embarrass you. I'd like to have a look in the bag. Yes, sir. 
one you had. Where's the girl? Thanks very much. You understand why you've been arrested? Yeah. yeah. Well, the clock has started. Under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, we've got 24 hours um, in, in which really to charge. I want you to say, to say that you want to solicit it. Right, can you just take a seat on there? First thing we must think about is a forensic examination of Pamela, because uh, you may recall that there were suggestions that she may have been raped. So, with her permission, we would uh, seek to take uh, intimate body samples from her um, for comparisons with anything that may have come from Mr. Piper. Please. Retirement pension book in the name Douglas Peter Piper, number 973-632. If they don't admit the murder yes. during the interview, what evidence have you got? the evidence really of the daughter, then we would be looking for corroborative evidence on the forensic side with regards to the paint on the shoes and um, the foot marks in the paint. Do you think the daughter will actually testify against her own mother for murder? I think she will because from all indications to date she doesn't have too much time for her mother and doesn't have too much respect for her. This is a most unusual case where it's the children disowning the parent as opposed to the parent disowning the child. But without forensic evidence, you're very dependent on that girl, aren't you? Totally. Totally. And or an omission. So we'll wait and see what happens on the interviews. If you need anything, you can just press the buzzer. Detective Superintendent Allen chose two of his most experienced officers for the vital interview with the suspects. Pamela Coletta was to be interviewed first. I had first dealings with her earlier today. Um, she seemed quite, quite at ease. She was, she was talking in the car back to the station. And she was OK being brought over here. Um, she can talk about general things. And she seems at ease. And uh, I don't see any problems, really. So, do you use this hard and soft technique? One plays the hard man, one plays the friend? No, no, no. no. no it's, it's just, if, if you can get in, in, into somebody, if you can get a crack into somebody and start somebody talking, whatever reason, then you carry on talking. I mean, if I can't get the lady to respond to me when I start asking the question, then, then and Tony can, then he'll talk. If he can't, then I'll talk. Pamela Coletta's legal representative, Peter Mulrooney, was present during the interview, which was recorded. And what's your relationship with Stephen Chandler? Well, we're serious together, you know. I think we want to get married and that, so... Where did you meet him? I met him at Doug's place, you know. He was... What was he doing at Doug's place? Well, he had nowhere to stop, right? And he was in introduced by one of... Uh, Doug's friends, right, and um, he put him up for a few days, or maybe a few weeks, I don't know. What did you do on Monday the 22nd of January then? I got to think very carefully. We went for a drink, I know. This was at half past nine, right? Half in past nine in the evening? Yes. Yes. We got, got back about, I think it was about half past eleven. Where did you go for the drink? Just over the Amherst Arms, over the road. So anyway, me and Steve went back, and about one o'clock, 
We went down the road, Doug asked him to go down the road and pick up some dog ends, right? Because we didn't have any money. Anyway, he did so. Of course, I, I was left alone with him. Who, hang on a minute, Doug asked who to go down the road Steve. and pick up dog ends? Yeah. Steve, yeah. yeah. This was about one o'clock, right? I think it was about one. And uh, whilst he was gone, he made an attempt to rape me, you know? Well, when you say he made an attempt to rape you, tell me what he did. Well, he just grabbed hold of me, right, and started kissing me and um, pulled up my jumper and uh, skirt and whatever. Pulled down my tights, but I pushed him away as hard as I could so that he couldn't have intercourse properly, you know? Was he clothed? He Doug? was... Yes, he was, he was clothed. He had his trousers down a bit, you know, and... And he tried to, you know, put his um, penis in, but he didn't attempt it because I pushed him away, right? And uh, after that, I was shouting and screaming and that, you know. All of a sudden, Steve come back, right? And that's when they had a go, you know, fight. What did Steve do to Doug? Well, he was punching him, you know, and kicking him and... Um, you know, just sort of laying into him. And then Doug went to sit on the bed settee. What he's done is tipped it over, right? And Doug's gone down the f on the floor. Who's tipped and it over? Steve, right? Yes. He's just got hold of it and just tipped it over like that. What, while Doug was sitting on it? Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Then he was still continued to, to uh, punch him and whatever, and that was it. Did you hit him? Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I did, yeah. And, and how did you hit him? I just kicked him on the leg, and I think I threw a cup or something. I'm not sure. That's all I've done. Then, <clears throat> I think Steve laid into him again. And that was about it. And then he got over the paint pot and tipped it over him. Did you tell him to stop it any time? Did you try to stop Steve doing No, that? I didn't, no. No. No, I did not, no. Because I thought myself he did deserve it in a way, because he's been he's been t treating me like dirt, and not only that he's been trying to palm me off with other people as well for money. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, he's been bringing up my family, telling them I'm this, I take drugs, I do this, I do that, and I didn't blame him for hitting him. But I, of course, I didn't want him to hurt him in any way. So what happened after after Steve finished hitting Doug? We went to bed. Where did you go to bed? In the other room. There's a bed in there. The other room, made love and that. <coughs> what, yourself, yourself and Steve went yeah. onto that bed and made love uh -huh. in that other room? Yeah. What did you do? Did you do anything to help Doug? No, I didn't actually, no. Did you think that he needed any medical help at all? No. When I felt him, he was dead. When was that? In the morning, because I turned him over, I was shocked. I went in there and I thought, he's not making no sound, you know? Now, Steve said that he was making a sound before, I think it was up to, uh, when was it? The early hours of the morning, and we didn't notice it went quiet until I got up, which was about seven o'clock in the morning. So what did you do then when you, when you discovered that, that Doug was dead? Well, there's nothing we could do, actually. We just packed our stuff and went, that's all. Did you call the police? No, we didn't. We didn't know what to do, to be honest. Did you light the fire in the flat? He put the fire on himself, <clears throat> uh, Steve, to see if he could get, get him warm, you know what I mean? Wh when was he that? He didn't realise probably he was dead, I suppose. When was that? Well, it must have been about half past seven. Then, before we left, we turned it off. Whereabouts, whereabouts was Doug's head when you switched the fire on? It was on the corner of the grate, here, down at the bottom there. Very close to the fire? Yeah, it was sort of on the grate, sort of, why resting. Did you, why did you want to warm him up? Well, it was his idea, actually. He said, I turn the fire on, see if we can, we can sort of uh, revive him a bit, I suppose. But mm. no way, it was stone cold. When you left the flat, yes. did you take with you yes. anything that belonged to Doug? No. Only uh, 
It's pension and box, that's all, nothing else. And it's why, why did you take his pension box? I don't know, really. Don't did, know. did he give you his pension box to look after at any yes, time? Yes, he did, actually, but... Um, um, I don't know what came over me, I just took, took his pension box. Where so were they? They were in a, like a gyro bank folder, blue one. Where, whereabouts were they in the flat? Um, they were in his pocket. What, on the clothes that he was wearing? Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, when... I went down, I'll be quite honest, I went down his pocket and got the thing out, the folder out. When did you do that? But I left his bus pass in there. When did you do that? When did before you take I that left. out? Before well, I left. On the Tuesday sleep. morning? Yeah. So it was while he was dead? Yeah. You went in his pocket? Yeah. And you took his pension books out? Yeah. How many books did you take? There were three off there. Yeah. I mean, did Doug, is, have you told me the truth about what Doug did? For, uh, I mean, yes. the man's dead, but yes. have you told me yes. the truth? Yes. That's what happened. Yes. Yes. When Stephen Chandler was interviewed, he was accompanied by the same lawyer. What relationship did Pam have with Doug? Well, as far as I was concerned, Doug kept saying it was his lady friend, I mean his girlfriend, but it wasn't. It was just like giving her money and that and using her as a slut and everything, you know what I mean? What do you mean using her as a slut? He was giving her money on a Monday and Thursday, right? Out of his pocket and that, right? Giving her drinks on a Monday and Thursday and that, and trying to palm off all these old boys and that, and blokes and that, you know what I mean? For money and things like that, you know? And they treated her like shit and everything, you know? Touched her up, slagged her off, everything in public. Last Sunday, right, Pam was in the bathroom, right, and he says to me, like, I don't know whether to tell you this. I said, what's that then? He says, well, I asked her, like, she wanted a few extra quid during the week for if she wanks me off, like, you know what I mean? I said, Doug, I said, don't worry about that. You know what I mean? I go, what does she say, yeah or no? She goes, yeah, she do it, right? So, like, Pam sat next to me on the couch, right, and she goes, what's the matter? I said, it's a chill man for a minute, right? I went out had a piss, come back in again. I go, what's this, you're going to wank him off flex for the money in the week? And she goes, is that what he said? I said, that's what he said, yeah. Because well, I told my f off, that's why I stand that into the living room, you know what I mean? I said, well, you don't go in the same room as him again, yeah? You <coughs> never can talk to the geezer again like that. I mean, you, you don't even look at him, right? But he's like, he does it in the cafe, everything like that. He's always trying to put his hand up the skirt, touch her tits up, everything, you know what I mean? And so I he's, been, he's been a pest and he's, he's, he's been touching her yeah, ever since I've known. Yeah, she don't need it. Yeah. She don't need it. Chandler was then asked about the night that Douglas Piper died. How much did you have to drink in the pub? Oh, I don't know. About? I don't know, about five pints, six pints or something, you know what I mean? And what about Pamela? She had about, I don't know, it's like a count with him, like she was knocking her back, you know what I mean, like she normally does, you know what I mean? Was she drunk? She wouldn't say, I wouldn't say drunk, as in drunk, but she was like merry sort of thing, you know, in a merry mood sort of thing, right? Were you drunk? I wasn't drunk, no, because when I go out with a lady or something, I don't get drunk. I make sure they get home all right, you know what I mean? Or yeah. wherever we're going, you know, I make sure they're all right, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not worth two them drug people being drunk, is it? No. You know what I mean? Well, if you get a lad, fair enough, you know what I mean? But not with a woman or something. Anyway, we come back, right? And about one o'clock, Doug says to me, do I go out and get some dog ends for us, right? So I said, you what? I said, we've got fags here. He says, no, I'm not smoking your fags, I'm not smoking your fags. I said, not mine, the Pam's all right, for any consolation to you. He said, I don't want to smoke any of your fags. I've had up here with all you, like, nothing but bloody bastards and things like that, your bums and that lot, yeah? So I said, all right, I'll go down, down the road, I'll find dog ends for you, right? So I went down the road, get some dog ends, right? And when I come back again, about 10, 15 minutes later, there was silence in the room there. And I thought, that's a bit strange, right, you know? They're usually talking, like, you know? Anyway, a little while later, Pam turned around and said, he tried to rape me. And I was, like, right, thinking, what the, you know, what's happening here, like, you know what I mean? He said to me, he said, no, nah, she's lying, she's lying, right? I said, Doug, I know what you're like, man. You can't keep your hands off her for five minutes, right? And I stood up, right, and he stood up. I don't know what I've done, right, but I started hitting him there, right? And the more I was hitting him, right, the more he was saying, hey, you're a bastard, you're a bastard, you bloody believe that old slag, that old slut and everything, what, you know what I mean? What did you hit him with? I was just doing it with my fists. Did you pour paint on him? No, I swear I got booted over, that did. That paint got booted over. You didn't pick a can up and pour it over his hips or his, his stomach no. area or his gentle area or anything no. like that? That paint him was down and I booted it, right? The lid was already half off anyway from where Doug had been using it earlier, right? 
and I booted it accidentally, and it went all over the place, right? And I picked it up. I don't know if I pulled it a bit down him more or whatever, but like, he got paint on him, and I got paint on me. So you could have pulled some paint I off him. I could have pulled him accidentally, like, you know what I mean? Picking it up, like, you know what I mean? Did you kick him on his torso? That is between yeah. between his hips and his neck. Did you I kick him, him anywhere? The, I kicked him in the stomach about twice. What, what, when he was standing up, or when he was kneeling down, or when he was lying down, when did well, you kick him was, in? It was sort of like kneeling down sort of thing. It was, it was like it's, it was like that. You know what I mean? So he was kneeling down. And was I he? I was foot up twice and it kicked him. Did you hit him on the head at all? I kneed him in the face there. Yeah. I hit him, right, yeah? Yes. And he went back on the couch, and he started to get back up again, yeah? And, you and he was up like that. Yeah. And his knee must have been up, well, his head was coming up to about that eye on me. Yeah. I just brought my knee right up and caught him in it. I know I hit him, right? Yeah. I know I hit the geezer, right? Yeah. But then hit him my hardest, you know what I mean? You didn't hit him your hardest? No. I tried holding back at first, but he kept answering back, and I, no, I was just losing myself, you know what I mean? All the way through it, I was losing myself. Yeah. All the time, he asked me back, asked me back, asked me back, yeah? All right? And I thought, why can't I just shut up, you know? Why can't I just keep his mouth shut? You know what I mean? Pam, Pam said to him, shut up when Steve's talking to you, right? He's giving you advice here, and you're just talking in his face, you know what I mean? All right? So... And I was going mad at him, because he kept talking back and that, and I was trying to teach him a lesson, not to treat Pam the way he's doing, not to treat the way he's been treating me, and not to... Give us privacy, you know what I mean? Give us, let's do what we want to do in life, you know what I mean? He, afterwards, right, yeah, right, he, he was sitting on the couch, yeah, right, and he got up, right, went to get up like that, and he just stumbled on the floor, right? You know what I mean? I said, Doug, man, what's the matter with you, man? What's the matter with you, man? He said, oh, I'm all right, I'm all right, like that, yeah? Right, and there's that paint thing, right, and his hand on top of it. Right, and he was breathing like he normally does, yeah, when he's asleep. And I thought he must have been like, you know, a bit up, a bit drowsy, like from the hitting I got I give him, yeah. I don't mean to hit him, like, I don't mean to kill him, I'm saying that now, right? You know what I mean? I swear to God, I didn't mean to do it, right? But like, he had his hand up and he was like, moving like that, yeah. He put down the paint in again, right? Come on, he's up again, doing it again, like that. And like, I look at him, he's breathing, he's like, <sighs> like that, right? And like, about a quarter to two, right, I said, Pam said to me, should we go to bed, right? I said, yeah, yeah, let's go to bed, right? Like, in the morning, right? Pam woke up and I woke up, it's before seven, right? And like, she goes, it's gone, it's all, it's all quiet in there, you know what I mean? It's only for Doug, because he's always clattering about, yeah? All times of the morning, right? Making cups of tea and things like that, yeah? And she's only going to see if he's all right, yeah? So she went into the living room, right? And she come come back again, right? And she goes like, he's dead. I don't think he's breathing, right? I said you're joking, ain't you? I said you got to be joking. She says no, he's not breathing. I said you damn sure about that? She goes yeah. She goes get out of bed, get out of bed quick, and see if he's all right. You know what I mean? See if he's dead or he ain't. You know what I mean? So I put my shoes on there, yeah? and I went in the living room. He was laying exactly the same position as what he was when we'd left him, yeah. I said, Doug, man, Doug, get up, what's the matter with you, man? Stop messing about, you know what I mean? Right? And I felt him, right? It was cold there. So I turned the fire on. Right? I was panicking, I didn't know what the hell to do. You know what I mean? So like me and Pam were held right to me to myself, right? And we started crying, didn't know what to do, you know what I mean? We st I stayed there next to an hour, hour and a half and that, but I put the blanket over him, you know what I mean? Yeah. I put the blanket he found on and put it over him as respect for the geezer, you know what I mean? And I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to kill him, you know what I mean? I said, what do we do? What do we do? I mean, we can't just leave him there. We can't, I mean, what are we going to do? I mean, someone finds him, right? Everyone's going to be after us. So there'll be a big bloody murder on their hands. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I said, I don't want that. So why didn't you go to the police at that stage? Because we were too scared to. Both of us were too scared to get in touch with anybody to do with the authorities, right? Did so, you take anything from the flat when you left the flat? Yeah, just all my belongings and that, you know what I mean? But I left my green sleeping bag there. What else did you take? Didn't take nothing apart from mine and Pam's stuff. Did Pam take anything else? No, just her stuff and my stuff. It was already in carrier bags anyway, behind the back of the couch. And the books, of course, yeah, but that book was already given to her. What books, of course? That pension allowance and all that lot. Where did Pam get that from? 
I think she got all done here until they were in the day, London, or something. Where did Pamela get that book from? Well, I don't know. She used to look after it for him, when she was living at home. Your guess is good as mine. Well, I don't have to guess, because I know where she got it from. Oh, She's no. told me where she got it from. Well, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Well, you were there when it was, was taken. I was there, yeah. I'm just guilty as Pam, but... This okay. tape is coming to an end now. The time is 8.43, and we'll switch this tape off now. You okay? No, man. You, you feel well enough to go on with the interview? That's another question to say, isn't it? Okay. Do you feel well enough to go on with the interview, or would you rather see the doctor first? If the doctor first, I've got a better headache coming on, you know what I mean? All right, then we'll, we'll um, have a break and we'll, we'll let him see the doctor first, and then we'll continue this interview after, the, after he's seen the doctor. OK. What's that soon? Uh, he's under a bit of pressure at the moment, Luke. Yeah. He was able to handle everything in that interview about the fighting and everything else. But the bit that seems to have upset him more than anything is that book and where did those books come from. He doesn't want to say that those books came from the body. He doesn't want to say that he took a book off a dead man in respect that he took it actually from the body. Um, and yet the lady has told us that she did. He's under pressure, he may well have a headache. I don't think it's bluff. I don't think he's trying to bluff. He's, he's not feeling very well. He's a bit shocked, I think. He, he's a bit shocked that we know where those books came from. Come up here, please. Stand over there. Pamela, Pamela Coletta and Stephen Chandler. You were both jointly charged with murder that you did on or before the 23rd of January 1990 at 13C Shacklewell Road, London North 16, murder Mr. Douglas Piper. That is against the peace, contrary to common law. You were both further charged with theft. That being on or before the 23rd of January, January charges, both of you do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you do say may be given in evidence. She never done nothing, like, you know what I mean? Well, I took his book. Well, yeah. If you listen to me, you both will be detained yeah. here and then later transferred to Dalston Police Station and you'll be appearing tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. at Highbury Corner Magistrates. All right? I'll fully explain the reasons yeah. for your detention later to both of you individually. Yeah. In the meantime, I've consulted with the uh, officer in the case, yeah. uh, Superintendent Allen, and he will allow you, under supervision, a five-minute visit with each other to talk about this. OK? Yeah, OK. okay. Yeah. Emotion involved, do you get with these sorts of situations? Nothing. Um, may sound callous, but uh, nothing. Um, one has, as we said, concerning the post-mortem, there's a job to be done. Um, they have committed the, the worst breach of the Queen's peace there could be, and that's a murder. Um, I'm here to prosecute and to investigate. And, uh, that's as far as I can be emotionally involved. But they are human beings. They may have gone off the rails. Of human beings. And you feel nothing? But I can't. How can I move on to the next case tomorrow if I feel something? How can I allow myself to be involved? Because um, I might have another ten of these this year. Um, I just can't do that. We're met in this solemn moment to commend Douglas Piper into the hands of Almighty God. In the presence of death, 
Christians have sure ground for hope and confidence and even for joy. So, in humble trust, we hear the words of Holy Scripture. Please be seated. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Only the murder squad attended the funeral of Douglas Piper. Nor will he keep his anger it was what is known as a pauper's funeral. We therefore commit his earthly remains to the elements, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, trusting the infinite mercy of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. On the 3rd of October 1990, at the Central Criminal Court, Pamela Coletta was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. She was put on probation for two years. Stephen Chandler was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Because of the judge's directions to the jury, Chandler and Coletta have both appealed against conviction. The squad are back at the same time next week with another investigation. Murder Squad by Tim Tate and Ray Wire containing further information about the investigation of murder has been published by Thames Methuen, price £14.99. Next week at 9, the Murder Squad investigate an explosion. All I can tell you at the moment is that there has been a fire at the address and unfortunately there are two dead bodies inside. Dreadful event. Fires such a claim as are unfortunate. It smells very strongly of petrol. Also, we retrieved an axe. From that point of view, it perhaps would suggest that uh, it, it was somewhat deliberate. Murder Squad, next Tuesday at 9. Next tonight on Channel 4, the film Codename Dancer.